I lead the cognitive computing and data sciences lab uh, at Cognizant. Uh, Cognizant is a MNC doing uh, service across three lines of business and um, we were originally founded in 1994. As far as the last Fortune 500 list is concerned, we are at 195. We employ around 2.5 lakh associates globally. And uh, I'm here to talk about our experiences in the medical space and the influence of deep learning and AI in medical space. Today's agenda is in four parts. First, we will briefly talk about medical imaging itself, kind of level setting the ground. And uh, we'll talk about trends and challenges that are there in the industry and the common solutions that are used to overcome some of these challenges. And finally, we'll share our experiences. There's some, of course, some time for Q&A, so my request is to hold on your Q&A if you have any. So I understand this is a mixed audience. Um, so people are from different groups. The next set of slides is to make sure we are all on the same page, of course, assuming we are on the same book uh, for all practical purposes. So some of you might have questions on what is so great about medical imaging, right? This is just another technology supporting a stream of science, right? So if you look back prior to uh, technology supporting healthcare, let's assume a patient or a subject comes and complains that he has got a physical pain to a doctor, unless and until the bone is sticking out of his hand and visibly people can see what is happening. There's no way for the doctor to say that he's got a fracture, right? So they used to go into something called experimental surgery. So what that means is technically cut open and see. Now the patient would actually have a lot more pain than the previous pain, right? So it, it is going to be a lot more confusing. So you can imagine the amount of wrong diagnosis, the amount of life-threatening events that could happen possibly because of that. From there, medical imaging has brought us to a point where even the brain functions can be non-intrusively mapped and figured out, right? So medical imaging and the importance of that is so significant in the scheme of things that the first award, Nobel Prize in physics was given to the guy who invented the x-rays, just in case uh, you guys already know that. So for the next 30 minutes, we'll actually use a, a simple definition so that uh, we are all on the same page again. So we will use this definition, thanks to Wikipedia, for uh, telling us what is medical imaging. In simple terms, medical imaging is the technique and process of creating visual representations of the interior of the body for clinical purposes, right? So there are two types of medical imaging. One is diagnostic, the other one is non-diagnostic. Names are intuitive. Very simply put, Non-diagnostic imaging is used not directly to help a physician, but indirectly. Some of the examples could be, uh, common examples are image-guided surgery or uh, brain-computer interface, right? Subsequent slides that I'm going to talk about is primarily on diagnostic images and things generated based on diagnostic images. So when we think of medical imaging, we think of X-rays, MRI scans, and CT scans, right? If we have personal experiences, it goes beyond one or two of that, right? But that's not the case. Medical imaging means images of tissue, fundus, ultrasound, ECG, EEG, endoscope, the list goes on and on and on, right? You can see that they are very, very varied set of images. It requires special skills to understand and read. I remember when I first held my x-rays, right side, left, right, and doctor came down and said, hey, that's not the way to hold, this is the way to hold. I'm sure all of you have your own experiences on that side. So that how complex these domain is. So where do physicians really start? So diagnostic images are grouped into five categories. Radiology, microscopy, photography, graphics, and others. X-rays, CT scans, and MRI scans, which are used for screening muscle and bone abnormalities, fall under the radiology umbrella. ECGs, EEGs are grouped under the graph. Later in the session, we will uh, touch on uh, histopathology and retinal, which are part of microscopy and photography respectively. The wide variety and the volume of different images that are being generated in the space has led to a substream, which brings us to a very important topic in medical imaging called computer-aided detection or diagnostics. 
again sticking to the original theme i want to make sure we all talk about the same set of uh, definitions so we'll again go back to wiki and borrow this definition for this presentation when we say at an abstract level they are the same but if you go into the nuances they are slightly different for for the sake of this conversation let's assume they are the same computer aided detection abbreviated as cde computer aided diagnostics abbreviated as cdx both are systems that look at medical imaging point out abnormalities and assist the physician or the clinician to do diagnosis and subsequent prognosis some of these systems have become so advanced that they just don't call out abnormalities anymore right they actually go down to tell you whether a disease is there or not whether there is a likelihood of disease happening or not they also go down to the level of grading some of these diseases for you right so they have that much of processing capabilities now right some of them go to the ultimate step of even giving recommendations kind of replacing uh, some of the very rudimentary analysis that a physician would do so moving on this part of the presentation will briefly look at the evolution of these medical imaging systems and the images themselves and how deep learning fits into all this and then we will look at state of the art and what is trending in that space and of course we will look at the new set of blockers and challenges these technologies bring to the table this graph by the way gives goes all the way back to 1660 till a few years uh, ago the first official description of photoacoustics was published by bell back in 1880 150 years ago believe it or not and it took 100 years from that point for us to actually have an mri scan available so it took that much of years for things to evolve despite the basic discovery it took that much of time it you 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 should not be surprised if i tell you the high definition image of a living tissue was taken less than a decade back that's how complex the whole space is so what was the real reason why the evolution took long lack of light sources so people understand light so we all understood physics right when you throw light it gets absorbed or reflected human body is not like that a very simple example is when you throw light on your body the same tissue that absorbs today might reflect the quantity of absorption and quantity of reflection varies right so that's how complex the whole system is so it took time for scientists to understand the whole space and it evolved so the source the deduction technology the data acquisition and the processing capabilities were the real limitations for us to kind of move or the reason for the 100 years to get to where we are right again now medical imaging have come a long way now we actually are looking at uh, digital radiology we are looking at uh, keyhole surgery we are even talking about augmented reality when it comes to doing some of these surgeries right um we have clearly shifted from physicians pretty much doing everything manually which is the era from all the way up to the 80s to systems based on heuristics helping or assisting the physicians which is the mid 80s to the modern day deep neural networks and cnns which are actually helping them go past and helping them do diagnosis and prognosis beyond that point so the shift is primarily driven by the fact that people wanted to actually get better care improved clinical outcomes and they wanted a lot more accurate outcomes people don't want to do trial and error on themselves so that's the history part of it right so where are we now in very simple terms systems have started outdoing humans that's the reality of the situation i have thrown in three examples here couple of them from stanford one from cornell the the first one that we talk about uses deep neural net looks at skin images and predicts uh, whether skin cancer exists or not in par with a dermatologist the cornell one uses neural net actually looks at x rays and predicts fracture in level with the radiologist the last one from stanford actually looks at chest x rays and detects pneumonia so the reason why i stuck to academic thing keeping in spirit with the conference this is publicly available the data the approach the outcome so you guys can look at it critique it reuse it 
extend on that, right? But the non-academic side of things, the big guys, IBM's, Microsoft's, Google's, they've all been making claims on these and not much of it is publicly available for us, but I'm hoping all of that would eventually become publicly available at some point in time. In the, the spirit of answering the question towards the end, I would actually request you to hold on to that question. If that question is not answered towards the end, we'll revisit that and answer that question. So let's actually look at a different perspective, right? We saw that uh, things have started out doing the doctors. Again, since that question prompted, I want to make a disclaimer here. That doesn't mean all the disciplines of medical imaging have actually started out performing the doctors. No, that's not what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is there are selective areas in which systems have started performing in par, if not above the humans, right? So with that said, let's actually look at the analyst perspective of how medical imaging is shaping up, right? Analysts are projecting hundreds of billions of dollars to be coming in to the system in the next five years, right? Market leaders are significantly investing in devices in the medical imaging space that use AI and ML and deep learning, right? Some of them are around personal medicine, patient data management and all around that, right? The major players are actively scouting for buyouts. We keep reading mergers, acquisitions all around. I'm sure all of you are aware of uh, DeepMind from Google, IBM acquired Explorers and Fitel, PTC acquired Colite, right? Clearly, analysts and the industry is not looking at AI and medical imaging as a competition to the physician, but helping him make the right decision quicker, right? That's how the, the industry is looking at it. So let's look at a different perspective. Now we looked at the academic side of the world. Um, academia has always been uh, the forefront or the vanguard of technology research, whether we like it or not, right? So these are the recent ones that are got published. So if you can see, there is a clear spike in the amount of publications, patents that are being done on this. This numbers, by the way, is specific to deep learning in the medical imaging space. And there's a reason why you see that from 2012 or 2013. I'll get to that in the later slides. And uh, there is a clear, bigger number if you were to actually add the allied. So this does not include the classic ML. This does not include all the other branches of AI. This is pure deep learning artifacts that are in the medical image space. So if you take a closer look at the publications themselves, right? While classic ML are still being used, almost one third of the artifacts are using neural nets, right? If you take a closer look at the neural nets themselves, you can clearly see that CNN is the most prominent or the one that is gaining significance, right? And while others are still there, they are still being used, CNN has made a significant impact when it comes to medical imaging. Okay, so what are the current challenges? So does it mean this has solved all the problems that physicians had before? Of course, some of the problems have gone away. Does it mean it will be too naive of us to think that there are no other problems? Technically speaking, these systems have introduced new set of problems to us, right? So what are those? It's a labeled desert as far as the medical imaging is concerned. What does that mean? There are images everywhere. So CAD systems are throwing images more frequently now and none of them are labeled. Very few set is labeled. So now you don't know which to use, which not to use to train your model. So that dilemma is kind of going to haunt us. So the next one is the data overload. So clinicians are in data overload. Now there are systems everywhere generating a lot of data. Now what technically we wanted to do was to simplify the physician's life by generating this data. But now what we have done is we have overdone that. So now there's a lot more data for the physician to look at. So technically this has become a little counterproductive. So the next one is digital silos. In the interest to gain the market share, most of the industry, what they have started doing they have started throwing in new systems. So these systems have their own proprietary way of capturing these images, storing them, processing them. Because they have their own way of looking at it, 
they don't talk with each other. Now the doctor doesn't necessarily have to look at a lot more sources to get the information. He has to also understand different systems. And these systems don't talk with each other. So he has to look at different systems to kind of come to his final conclusion. The next one, of course, is the compliance and the governance. So with the social era and increasing demand for instant gratification, of course, uh, we want to actually have more compliance and governance. FDPR, I'm sure all of you are uh, aware of GDPR. And how do we ensure that these systems store this information securely and share only to the legitimate stakeholders, right? And the last one, which is, in my opinion, the most important one, is the trust, right? How do humans really start trusting decisions made by these systems, right? How do we make them transparent? How do we make them less bias? How do we remove the data bias or the algorithm bias so that people can really look at what is happening? How do we make the whole thing transparent? We don't have answers to all of them. We have answers to some of them. Some of them still continue to be riddles. That's for the research community to kind of come up with more solutions down the line. So in this section, we'll refresh some very fundamental items about deep learning, neural nets, and in the context of digital imaging again. And we'll also look at some possible solutions to the challenges that we saw on the earlier slide. OK, a quick peek into the history of how we got here. Initially, before the pre-deep learning era, there were two distinct styles. One was ML with feature input and followed by the ML with image input itself. In the pre-DL era, we would actually do sequential applications which did a lot of low-level pixel processing followed by mathematical model, which was actually computed using a, a simple heuristic rule set, and it was a point solution that we created. So uh, a simple pixel operation would be like edge detection, line detection, and stuff like that. Mathematical models would be line fitting, curve fitting, items around that. So since the 90s, right, supervised techniques came into picture. That started pushing the whole neural net in a different direction. The real push happened when back propagation came into picture. That was in the 80s, right? Late 80s, early 90s. So prior to back propagation, it was only feed forward. So basically, you take your input, do your analysis, get the output. If the output doesn't match what you want, you manually go back, tweak things, then send it again and hope it works this time. With back propagation, the error aspect, how far is your prediction, how far is your classification from the actuals, is taken, fed back into the system. And that made the system a lot more better. Then we had this whole problem of vanishing gradients. So what does that mean? The feedback that was coming in was not sufficient. The system was not learning. Right? So what did that mean? That actually meant we couldn't have deep nets. Features were not fully getting identified. Your models were not converging. So compute power was not sufficient to get to what you really wanted to get to in the time that you had. Then, something really happened in 2012. Unsupervised pre-training, AlexNet coming into picture, opened the floodgates. So that is why in the previous graph, in 2013 and forward, you see a lot of research work happening. Because that, in very ways, minimized the vanishing gradient problem. So from then on, people could have a deeper neural net, a wider neural net, and it could be a lot more uh, efficient when it comes to getting the outcome it wanted. Right? So after 2012, the deep learning and the CNN hasn't looked back at all in many ways. It's only forward, and we have done a lot of stuff after the point. OK, let's actually talk about some very, very fundamental things. OK, assuming all of you understand that computers don't look at images the way we look at. We look at images. They look at numbers. Right? So uh, a pattern recognition, in a pattern recognition, feature is nothing but a, a unique measurable property that uniquely identifies a particular image. In very simple terms, uh, if you show the image of a human, uh, nose, uh, eyes, mouth, all that forms a set of features. Right? The aspect of identifying these features is called feature engineering. Okay? So, we have some basic tasks like classification and localization. Classification is nothing but taking a, a new image input, trying to find out which of these buckets it belongs to. In this case, it's a sheep image. It's been classified as a sheep image. 
What is localization? You identify your region of interest, ROI for short. So we often draw a boundary. Here our interest is the sheep, so we have drawn a boundary around that. So the next one is object detection. So in the image, if we have more than one set of objects that sort of interest, then we call them out. In this specific case, we actually have three sheep. If we had a dog and a cat and that is of interest, you would have actually seen the bounding box around that as well. And the next is segmentation, right? Segmentation in many ways is a logical grouping of the items that you see in the image. There are two types, instance and semantic. Semantic is just clubbing all of them together. Instance is declassifying them inside of the instances themselves. Hopefully, you guys are still with me. I haven't made you sleep yet. I haven't seen anybody use the two-step policy that was described in the earlier thing. Good. So, what is the basic difference between classic ML and the deep learning as we go forward, right? So, the feature engineering or the feature extraction that we spoke about in classic ML happens manually. So you get hold of a subject matter expert, you get hold of an engineer, you give him an image of a human and say, okay, now you tell me what is the feature. The SME would actually say two eyes, nose and a mouth makes this image distinct. The engineer would code that and then the engineer would decide whether this is a classification problem based on the task, pick the algorithm, send the input through it and get the output. Again, in the interest of earlier, I, I like your question. We will definitely get to that question if, if it's not answered towards then. Yes, the answer, short answer is yes, we'll get to it. So in deep learning, what we do is the manual intervention has reduced. I'm not gonna say it is eliminated, it's reduced, right? You pick the architecture and the architecture decides what feature to pick and what task to perform, right? So the amount of manual intervention has dropped. If you guys were there in the morning speech, you would have heard him talk about auto ML, which is the next level of deep learning, where people are not even expected to do this. You just give an annotated sample input, everything else is done for you, behind the scenes. I'm hoping, excellent. Okay, did I do something? Hopefully that was not the case, okay. Okay, keeping up with the, the, the difference again. So classic ML and deep learning. Okay, before I go further, uh, let me just quickly highlight what is anomaly. That's a new term I introduced in this slide. Uh, in very simple terms, it is to identify the outliers. So you train a system to spot things that are different from what it is being trained on. So based on which school of deep learning you're from, you might look at it as classification or you might actually say, no, no, that's a different discipline altogether on the other end of the spectrum, okay? So that's a different topic we'll discuss later. So for all practical purposes, these are the different tasks. Classical ML has all the algorithms available to do them and deep learning has the same set of algorithms to do them, right? So in, if, if I were to actually take a second step at this, what really is happening is classical ML improvements on the algorithms have slowed down, right? Because deep learning algorithms are becoming more accurate predictable and faster. So in essence, what I'm trying to tell you guys is while classical ML is still there and it is still happening, the pace at which things are coming out now have slowed down. You would have seen that in the graph that we showed earlier, right? So with deep learning, that's not the case. So all of it is moving towards a neural net, specifically CNN in case of digital imaging and digital image processing space. So I've been talking about uh, CNN, 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 all. Let me just tell you guys what CNN is. So if you guys already know, bear with me for the next uh, few minutes, right? So what is CNN? CNN is nothing but another artificial neural network what, that is specifically put together to spot patterns. What helps them to spot the patterns? They actually have a layer called convolutional layer, which help them to find these patterns. So I don't want to tell you guys that uh, CNN's do not actually have uh, fully connected layers. They have connected layers, they have convolutional layers also. They are like any other artificial neural net, but the only additional thing is the convolutional layer, right? So what is the convolutional layer? Convolutional layer is nothing but a set of filters. So for, for simplicity, filter you can assume as a, a simple two-dimensional array. 
let's assume there's a three by three matrix. So we initialize it with some random numbers. Once we get an input image, this three by three filter is slid over the input image all the way through till there is no other image to browse. This process is called convolution and that's why we have the name convolution neural network. So I apologize for all the statisticians in the room. So what happens when it slides over each of these pixels group is a dot product of this uh, matrix is done with the source matrix and that becomes another number, right? And we create a separate matrix at that point and that is fed into subsequent layers. Okay, hopefully you guys are with me so far. Okay. Since there are multiple matrix and a lot of multiplication, just like any other neural net, there's a pooling layer. For those who do not know what pooling layer, it is just a way to uh, kind of abstract the uh, dimensionality so that it is easier to handle subsequently with minimal loss. Of course, there are different ways to do that. The most popular one is max pooling, which means you just pick the top one in that loop, move and move on. So the in a convolutional setup, the initial filters are uh, for identifying simple patterns. It could be lines, curves, and stuff like that. The deeper the filters you add, they gain the capability to do a lot more complex patterns. It can actually be to identify the eyes, nose. It can even identify the human face, right? So how deep you go kind of decides the, uh, the quality of information that you are going to gain from the input, right? So the, the final layers are the fully connected layers in a CNN. So they do the aggregation and the final task, which is classification or whatever that you want to do, right? The initial layers are to get the patterns and the extractions from the input image. Hopefully you guys are with me so far. Okay. Okay. Now, have we actually, now that we understand how CNN works, the problems that we had earlier, right? The unlabeled data, has that gone away? No, we still have that problem. How do we overcome that problem, right? So that we can use this CNN to efficiently do the tasks that it want the uh, network to do, right? So two of the most commonly used approaches, one is uh, called transfer learning. Uh, very simply put, you take the knowledge from a pre-trained neural net and use that to do your tasks for a different domain, right? So the, the, the philosophy there, we have, we have all seen teachers, students, right? Teachers actually go through the process of learning and then telling us and students actually kind of grab that. So it is very similar to that from a philosophical perspective. So what does this really mean? So this is an example from one of, one of our own experiments. So as I said earlier in the uh, CNN description, the last layers are the aggregation layers. So we kind of remove them and we replace them or swap them with the way we want to actually do the subsequent tasks. We use the earlier convolutional layers and that knowledge is transferred over, okay? So in very simple terms, you don't have to go tune your parameters one more time because this model is already built. It can actually do a decent job of predicting the outcome. So there's no waste of time. You can leverage all that and move on to what is more important to you to actually get the output, right? A word of caution there is um, you probably want to pay attention to what is the base model that you pick. The reason why I say that is uh, let's assume you want to do a classification of human specimens, right? Uh, man versus cow versus maybe an uh, exotic bird. It's okay to actually pick it from the ImageNet database, right? The model that is built on top. But if you want to actually do a face detection, you are better off picking up something from VGG than some, some other else, right? So try to see if you can pick the base model closer to the problem statement that you have already solved or you're expecting to solve. So the next option is to do data argumentation to overcome the data problem that we actually have. So very simply put, you take whatever data is available to you, apply uh, something on top of it, turn it, flip it, rotate it, and do all that. From a neural net's perspective, it would be looked at as a new set of data for it to train, right? It is as simple as that. 
So some of the commonly used techniques are geometric methods, photometric methods, and adversarial methods. Of course, uh, the GANs by themselves is a different topic altogether. Uh, the geometric methods are flipping, cropping, scaling, rotation. I'm sure all of you guys are familiar with this. These are standard stuff that we do on, on most of the imaging techniques. Photometrics is where we play with the color filters. We apply additional uh, histograms on top of it or remove noise, add noise and stuff like that. And from a GAN perspective, just to give you guys, uh, for those who are having trouble, what is GAN? Um, it is a uh, network which actually has two parts to it. Uh, uh, the, the best analogy I can think of is a faker and a cop put together in the same one. So basically you take an input, the faker part of the network kind of morphs it and creates a new image from it. The checker part tries to identify if it is able to find out if it's fake or not. So that's, that's, the, that's the setup. Again, that deserves a full session by itself, so I don't want to kind of go into that detail. But from a technique perspective, that's a technique people use for data augmentation to overcome the data problem. So what else is happening when it comes to the trends part of deep learning, right? From an object identification perspective. So there is a concept of domain transfer GAN where you take image inputs from one domain and then reuse that for another domain for training the models, right? The other popular ones that are being in the academia being heavily looked at is one-shot learning and zero-shot learning as the name suggests. They want to actually use minimum number of inputs to build your model. Both are variants of transfer learning in, in practical purposes. The, the last one, no, no discussions in CNN would be complete if we don't mention capsule network, right? So very simply put, it's, it's a neural net within a neural net. So you, you actually have neurons that activate on an individual basis, right? These are some of the ones that are happening right now on the digital image, again, uh, uh, a disclaimer, there are a lot more work happening on the DL, on the non-digital imaging as well. But these are the ones that directly affect the digital imaging and the medical space. Okay, so the this next set of slides I'm going to talk about is the, the couple of experiences that we have had, right? The first one that I'm going to talk about is uh, cancer redirection that we actually worked on uh, for breast cancer. And the second one that I'm going to talk about is the diabetic retinopathy uh, using fundus images. Both were built using deep learning networks. And uh, this helped us to appreciate the domain and the technology much, much better prior to us starting it. Right? Uh, breast cancer is the most common form of cancer in women. It is so common that one in eight is actually globally diagnosed with it, I believe. And it's the second leading cause of death in women, simply because 60% of the detection, I believe, happens in the final stages. Right? We picked this focus area almost uh, 12, 16 months back. And uh, our intent was to look at uh, digital whole slide images to help pathologists classify these images as normal, benign, malignant, and grade them as in situ or invasive, right? In situ technically means the tumor is within the organ that, that originated that, and invasive means it's already spread and we are in the final stages and it is life-threatening. From a process perspective, what really happens is um, there's a physical examination done, and uh, the doctor looks for unusual lumps. And if the subject is less than 30 years, most often it's not a problem, but if the subject is more than 30 years, the first order of business is to uh, get a mammogram or an ultrasound done. And if those two kind of direct to abnormalities, then what is done is a biopsy. In very simple terms, a piece of the tissue or the uh, lump is taken out, a slice of it is taken, a coloring dye is put on top of it and put it under the slide. And that slide is called the whole slide right? And that image is digitized. So all of us would have seen slides, right? They are this big. But when you actually put them under the microscope and zoom it 400x, they actually become much bigger than the screen. So imagine a pathologist looking through this big of an image, finding out abnormalities, right? So it is a tedious process and it is very, very labor intensive. There is a fair chance a lot of it is going to be missed. So that's why this is being looked at as the last resort. So what we when our idea was to see how we can help them. So the way we kind of went about doing it is our thing started after the digital imaging 
part of it. We took the whole slide image, broke that into patches, manageable smaller chunks of patches. We looked for normal, benign and malignant within that. And when we found a pattern, we put them together. Right? Post that, what we did was, we actually did segmentation. We clearly called out the different nuclei within the image. We colored them or highlighted them in a way that the pathologist can understand. Then, as part of the quantitative analysis, we started giving the count of uh, mitotic and atypic uh, nuclei, so, so that the, the pathologist can take those numbers and compare that with the upper and the lower boundary, and eventually do the grading of whether something is cancerous or not. Right? So, the whole model was built on transfer learning. We took the base model from uh, an ImageNet trained image, and then we built on top of it, we fine-tuned it. As I said earlier, we lost the last aggregation layer. We added our own layer so that it can do what we wanted that to do. Moving on, the, the next case study I'm going to talk about is uh, the diabetic retinopathy case study. Uh, apparently, this is also a leading cause of blindness. And if, if you don't detect this earlier enough, it can lead to permanent blindness in humans. And people who are diabetic are extremely prone to getting diabetic retinopathy. Right? So, just like any other medical setup, the patient to doctor ratio is very skewed here as well. Right? So, when, when, when there was an NGO, uh, Karnataka based NGO, they reached out to us and they said, hey, we want you guys to help us. We realized the gravity of the situation. In a, in a developed country itself, the ratio of patients to doctors is very skewed. In a developing country like India, it is so skewed that the patient does not get to see the doctor in a very long time. Right? First time he comes in and sees the doctor, and the next time he's going to get a chance to come and see, is going to be way, way too long by the time he, he might end up becoming blind as well. Right? So when these NGO came and reached out and told us and explained us the problem, we were, we were kind of very excited to get on board and see how we can actually help them. Right? So, we got on board around 24 months back and uh, we kind of put a solution together for them and now we are in the pilot phase with them and we are actually doing pilots as we speak. So, from a solution perspective, right, we, we built the model originally from a 35,000 base image. Okay? And uh, in that process, we started off with CPU, slowly graduated to GPU, now we actually have an NVIDIA DGX1 for the processing capability power. Again, based on the best practice when we started, we did something called binarization. What that means is technically lose the color information in the image, bring it to grayscale, and we actually did normalization. Technically, what that means is change the size of the input image, right? Irrespective of whatever the source image is, you change the size. We, we were fully convinced, because these were the best practices suggested at that time, that we will get the best of outputs, and the output was not that great. And then, upon reflecting, we realized that we are losing valuable information when we do this. So, we started retaining the source image size, we started retaining the color information, and that made a lot of difference when it comes to the output prediction. Right? We actually used, yes. Okay. So, okay. let me give you some more uh, insights into this. So, the way it is practically done is a person uh, whose subject puts his eye on a device and a camera operator takes a photo. So, there's a flash of image, uh, a light flash is done in your retina that is reflected back which is observed and that is stored in the digital image. Right? So, just like how you take a photo camera of yourself, the same thing is done but inside the eye. So, the, the glare there actually means overexposure or an unwanted exposure to a specific area. Right? So, not getting into too much of detail, uh, the pupil size varies from geography to geography and the amount of light that you relay also has to be, the intensity of the light that you relay have to be controlled based on that. Right? So, this is so complex that even if the device is the same, if the operator is the same, if the patient is the same, if you take two shots, the two images will not be the same. That, that is how complex the whole setup is. Right? And of course, uh, camera artifacts like there might be a mosquito sitting right in front or <laughs> a, a simple 
dust or speck of a dust, mosquito is too much. If the guy can't see a mosquito, then he's blind already, right? So there could be a speck of dust there, right? So all that adds to the camera artifact, okay? So again, we wanted to do transfer learning in this. The learning was not to do transfer learning in not all the cases. We built these model from, from scratch after going through the journey. Of course, we extensively used data augmentation in this because of the fact that we couldn't get enough samples, right? Okay, moving on. So what was our learning from all this, right? Invest in your data set. See, most often people assume that deep learning programming is all about coding. In our experience, it is less than one-fifth. A significant chunk of time has to be spent in getting the right data. Okay? So, more does not mean better. Okay? I'll tell you a practical example. We had so much of left eye image samples which were uh, non-DR that if you give an image to us, we were prone to tell that you don't have DR because that's the samples we had, right? Then we realized that that is, that is bad and then we started applying many data augmentation techniques and started hunting for quality images. So if you have a, a five class classification that you want to do, your training image sample size should be evenly distributed across, right? Make sure that you have quality data for you to build your models on. The next one model is not a black box, okay? Uh, there are sessions happening in this conference and all around which is talking about explainable AI and understanding why certain things are being given as outcomes by the different models. Again, that's an evolving space. I'm not saying everything that the machine does is explainable at this point, but there is some amount of explainability that can be derived from what is being done right now. And the last one is in keeping spirit with that of the conference and similar conferences like this. Being engineers, we, we tend to start writing everything from scratch, right? So I have that habit myself. So I think the other one is not right or I don't actually believe in what that is, right? So we start writing. Don't do that. Start off by borrowing ideas and models that are already there. It's a two-way street, by the way, right? So once you think something is working, I would suggest you to contribute back as well, right? So the two... Uh, case studies that we spoke about, both are in pilot and uh, we are hoping to see a lot more of them coming out and uh, that actually brings me to the end of this session. So I first of all want to, before I take the questions, thank the ODC for having me here. Thank you guys for listening patiently. So now going back to the two specific questions that you had, are they still open? Do you actually, okay, no problem. So. Can you repeat your questions? I'll see if I can answer them. Okay. So, uh, the straightforward answer is we are not trying to replace the doctor with this. And I don't think that is going to happen. Right? There are very, very rudimentary things. Let's take the DR example that we do. The actual screening process, the photo taking process, the screening process of somebody has diabetic retinopathy or not, the initial screening is not done by doctors. It is done by technicians. And they are short in number. So the ratio is so skewed that 1 is to 100 plus is probably the number we are looking at. So these systems are not trying to take away jobs from these technicians or doctors. These systems are trying to address a market space which was left unaddressed if these systems were not there. That's, that's the way I would rather look at it. And doctors can do a lot more efficient work. So very simply put, if you were to actually look at uh, uh, cardio CT scan, I believe there are thousands of images a doctor has to look at, comprehend all of it, and then look at what is of interest to the patient, which is very, very rudimentary stuff to look at abnormalities, which can be done by the machine. So the doctor can have an efficient eight-hour window where he can still perform the same job at even better outcome compared to what would have otherwise taken 16, 17 hours. He can actually have a proper work-life balance, if I were to put it that way. So that's where all these systems, that's where I believe these systems are going towards. You had a second question. I see a few more hands, but... Uh, huh, okay. 
So the answer is, if we have labeled data, then there's nothing like that. Excellent. But who will label it? The same doctors who are sitting and addressing the patients have to label it. Right? That's where the, the it's, it's, a, it's a predicament. You understand that, right? So it's a chicken and egg problem. So the doctor will he actually be looking at the patient or coming and actually labeling the data set for you. Right? So that is where if you have labeled data, excellent. If you don't have a labeled data, we actually have techniques which will build on top of existing labeled data. Or we actually use unsupervised techniques to see if we can proceed further. So labeling is an excellent option, good path. If we don't have, we still have to figure out alternative ways. Otherwise, we are going to get into another winter session. Yep. Yeah. Uh, like I would like to add on to the answer which you gave for that person. Okay. Will doctors replay, I mean, uh, will uh, deep learning or this data science replace doctors? See, I think even if it replaces it, we should encourage it because in countries like India and Africa, there's not a lot of people don't get the medical facilities and stuff. As you mentioned, the ratio of doctor to patient is mm -hmm. very huge, especially in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and India companies. So this is one area where we need data science to splurge and you, we need that advancement exactly. really. And uh, one more thing is it is not going to replace doctors. I, I mean, uh, all your case studies were related to uh, breast cancer and the uh, eye. But I've done a lot of research in neuroscience specifically. Mm -hmm. So I've been reading a lot of literature in uh, neuroscience and the advan advancement of data science into that. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, uh, those case studies were quite interesting. Mm -hmm. So those are areas where doctors cannot make an advancement without the help of data science. Exactly. So there's particularly a case study, if you're interested, and if the audience is interested, this particular case study by uh, MIT. Okay, it's called optogenetics, uh, where it is like uh, finding the accurate area in your brain. So for disorders like schizophrenia and all the psychological disorders, uh, the, I mean the constraint which they have is they want to find the accurate area in your brain where the neural uh, pathways are inactive. So for schizophrenia patients, there are several areas in their brain which is inactive compared to the uh, patients who are, the uh, normal patient will have, uh, you know, neural connections in those areas. So their challenge is that. So with the help of data science now, there is a lot of, they have tested it out in rats. So they're able to like find out the exact regions in brain where, uh, which are inactive and Excellent. stuff. With so the, uh, in, in principle, we agree. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there's also research which is happening in Princeton lab. It's out in YouTube. So all of you can uh, check it out. So there's a lot of interesting case studies in neuroscience which is actually happening. So I think this is one area where all of us should support the advancement. And uh, yeah, even if AIO takes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, by the way, are you uh, involved in neuroscience research and cognizant? Yes, we actually are. Uh, exploring at least my team, we are looking at uh, EEG images, we are looking at ECG images, we are trying to understand. I'm not at liberty to disclose everything and uh, there are different teams working on different items while we are assisting some of them. Yes, the ans short answer is okay. yes. Uh, is the team, does the team have an equal amount of domain experts or it's a purely a technical team or? Again, I'm not at liberty to discuss uh, certain other items uh, outside my domain. So to, we can probably take it offline and we can probably yeah, yeah, discuss I'll that. I saw a few Hello. more hands go there. I don't know how, how are we doing on time. Hello. Uh, so basically, uh, yeah. Uh, so you showed the state of the artwork uh, going in Stanford, Cornell. I don't similar. know where this voice is coming from. Uh, it's coming oh, from here. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> ah. So hi, uh, I am Ashish. So basically, uh, in the industry also, they have R&D teams which are working on this uh, topic and yes. in the deep learning and. Uh, so, uh, my question is like, when, well, how far we are from commercialization? Basically, in the breast cancer area also, detection of that, basically work uh -huh. has been going for a long time. Correct. But still, I don't see uh, a lot of products coming out of it. So, Correct. Uh, so, so, there are different reasons for that. Um, just to extend on your earlier part of your question, I did not purposefully talk about the, the non academic side simply because some of this are maintained as trade secrets. They don't want to disclose. A lot of it is not disclosed except for one or two random papers published by Google or Microsoft here and there. Uh, I, I want to keep to the spirit of the conference. So the openness is what we want to actually promote. 
So that is why I kept to that. To answer your first part of the question, yes, there is a lot of work happening. And uh, the reason for that is, I am going to say a different thing here, hopefully you guys can still follow. There is the whole concept of Confucius matrix, right? False positives, true positives, false negatives, true negatives. What is the implication of something kind of drives when some of these solutions become commercial? So let us assume an outcome falsely identifies something as malignant. The implication to that is less, slightly less compared to if the same thing says that you are not malignant when it is malignant, right? So that kind of drives some of this commercialization aspect. So to, on the positive note, uh, FDA has approved the diabetic retinopathy screening device. Now the device can actually do a screening and tell you whether you are uh, retina or you are subjected to diabetic retinopathy or not, right? So we are getting there, but a lot of this is simply because the supporting technology is also evolving and the trust aspect that I was talking to you about. There is less of transparency, which is why there is a delay. So we are moving in the positive direction, just to answer your question. And if you want to give me a timeline, I have no idea. Your guess is as good as mine. One last question. Quickly, huh? so, uh, any inputs on validation, how you validate that? Probably you brought a point about FDA approval and all. Huh. So how it is taken in EMA or uh, in medical See, device? medical imaging is a lot more complicated. So we, we have worked with a lot of partners and support systems. So uh, the way things are looked at is also very different. So the software is no more a software if it actually has a direct implication to a human, right? So if it is, it, it can be classified as a device, right? A device by itself, if it doesn't actually do a diagnostic thing, then the set of certification that is required for it is very different. And exactly, when it comes to Europe, it is different. When it comes to Asia, it's different. When it comes to India, it is very, very different, right? The only mature market I would say is US, which is where FDA is driving some of this. They have significant amount of norms laid down for devices, software alone, device plus software. So that I would say has taken them anywhere from two to three decades now to get to where they are. And they themselves have come out and agreed. Exactly, they have come out and agreed that this by itself cannot be the final one, right? So they are selectively doing a lot of this. So in that, I forgot the actual question. I don't know if I answered it. Huh. Huh. I have an interesting point of view on that, right? So from a software perspective, the way we do testing and validation is very different from how the medical domain is looking at some of this. So if you go tell them that I did a test run for two hours, a clinician would look at you and say, are you kidding me? I've actually been looking at this solution for 10 years and I still am not confident that this is gonna work. So they are worlds apart to be very simply put. So in our experience of taking some of this to a practical field, what we realized is an inclusive approach where we kind of bring them on board and keep telling them, it is, it is, end of the day, they do not know how to trust what is coming out of the system. So transparency. Exactly. So it is evolving space is what I would actually summarize. One last question, yeah. please. Thanks, Mr. Balaji, for ah. your nice and uh, interesting talk. I want to ask you how the data augmentation is done when we are transferring the do domain. Okay, so they are overlapping. So when you actually say, um, a simple example I can think of is the five streams that we talk about in medical imaging, right? So we have seen a lot of radiology images taken and applied to photography. So we take those, apply one of the three techniques that we discussed, transform it into something else and move it on. So again, uh, adversarial networks by themselves is a big discipline and uh, again, I hope I kind of and one and to add on, uh, do you ah. think that uh, in future the radiologist should be AI expert? Should be an AI expert. Um, as it stands, uh, as as we discussed earlier, there are some uh, expertise already built by the AI. So radiologist at some places can be replaced as it speaks. But again, it is the future prediction is anybody's guess at this point. 
Maybe. 